Please join me again in the book of Lamentations, chapter number 3, verse number 49. The book of Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah, has the sad song of Judah, Jerusalem, coming under God's judgment because of sin. And uh, Jerusalem seems to be doing a lot of crying because of the things happening to her. But I think it's possible that Jeremiah slips a little bit of his own story uh, into the midst of this sad song here at verse number 49. Because it says, My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until he who is from heaven looks down and sees, my eyes cause me grief at the fate of all the daughters of my city. Now that could sound like Jerusalem by itself, crying over the loss of all uh, the young people uh, in the falling of the city. Uh, But it goes on with something that sounds much more personal to an event in Jeremiah's life. Verse 52, I've been hunted like a bird by those who were enemies, my enemies, without cause. Uh, Now, Jerusalem, Judah, had enemies for a cause because they'd been unfair and uh, duplicitous and uh, a lot of the nations around them didn't really like them at this point in their history. But Jeremiah had gone for 40 years as God's prophet in Jerusalem and had been mistreated by a lot of people without that being fair at all. Verse 53, they flung me alive into the pit. Now that instantly should remind you of how he was grabbed and thrown into the bottom of a water reservoir that was mostly empty, uh, down into the mud and the muck, and he was just going to be left there to die because they didn't like him. They didn't like what he was saying in his prophecies. Uh, And it was only because of Ebed-Melech petitioning to King Zedekiah on Jeremiah's behalf that he got pulled out of that muck and mire. So it could be that this is a reference to that event. And if so, we get a little bit more information. And they cast stones on me. Maybe they were throwing stuff at him. Water closed over my head. Uh, As I said, this was a muddy bottom to a mostly empty uh, water reservoir. So when he first got uh, dropped down in there, he might have slipped and ended up with water over his head, maybe. Uh, I said, I'm lost. And certainly he would have felt that that was the end of his life at that moment. He was somewhere in his early 60s, I would guess, when that event happened, Uh, and uh, being abandoned into the bottom of an empty water reservoir uh, with your body heat being sucked off by the mud, that doesn't sound like you'd be able to survive that very easily. Verse 55, I called on your name, O he who is, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. So I think that that might actually be Jeremiah's testimony of how God told him to hang in there until Ebed-Melech showed up and uh, pulled him out of the muck. Uh, You have taken up my cause, O he who is. You've redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O he who is. Judge my cause. You've seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. You've heard their taunts, O he who is. All their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold, they're sitting and they're rising. I am the object of their taunts. So apparently he was mocked mercilessly. Uh, during his ministry. And we're talking about a 40-year ministry. Uh, And here he uh, is begging God to remember all of that and do something about it. Uh, This becomes an imprecatory prayer, imprecatory having this sense of curse. Uh, He's putting the curse of God 
on those that have caused him trouble. You will repay them, O he who is, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart, or actually it might be more of a request here. Give them dullness of heart. Uh, may your curse be on them. Uh, pursue them in anger. Destroy them from under your heavens, O he who is. Uh, you know that David wrote similar psalms whenever he felt people were betraying and misusing and abusing him. Uh, he always left it in the hands of the Lord to do what was right. And so that's what's happening here, I think, with Jeremiah as well. Now he shifts his attention back to the city and the temple and how it's gone, how it's been ruined. Chapter 4, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. Uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, the temple complex in particular, had a lot of gold and silver in it. Uh, the temple complex built by Solomon uh, had trillions of dollars of valuable material used in it. Uh, as far as I can tell, it was the most expensive building per square foot or per cubic foot ever built in the history of the world. And yet now it's gone. In a matter of days, it's dismantled and... Uh, cannibalized and dis and destroyed the holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street so jerusalem and the temple have been dismantled and erased uh, the precious sons of zion worth their weight in fine gold how they are regarded as earthen pots the work of a potter's hand so as beautiful and as valuable as the physical structure of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount was, the people were more precious. And they're all being taken away and have no more value in the minds of uh, some of the Babylonians that are processing them than just ordinary earthen pots. They're just people. Verse 3, even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young. So you've got these wild animals uh, that they take care of their babies. But the daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. Now, the word ostrich in our English may not represent the actual Hebrew it's a little hard to pin it down which animal is in mind here. The word has something to do about a noisy uh, animal. Uh, ostriches, as far as I know, are not really all that noisy. Uh, so whatever animal this is, it doesn't care for its young, evidently. And we know that there are some animals, they lay the eggs and then they disappear. They don't even bother to try to brood them. Uh, other animals can have their babies and then kind of leave them with the nursing animals in their group, and then they just disappear themselves. They don't pay attention to their offspring anymore. Uh, so that's what's being brought out here, is that even the wild jackals care about their babies and nurse them, but the Israelis, the Judeans, are like this, this animal, this bird perhaps, that doesn't even bother looking after its young. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives it to them. So that was the situation at the terminal point of the siege, when the famine was at its peak. The little babies were dying of starvation and dehydration. The older children were begging for food. Mommy, mommy. Daddy, Daddy, where's the food? I'm starving. I'm so hungry. I, I feel like I'm going to die. And no one has anything to give it to them because of the judgment of God that's come at this point. Those who had once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. Now that is a 
That is a slap at the higher echelon of Jewish society at this time. Uh, The people that used to live in the palace and in the fancy homes, uh, before the siege started, they were dressed in the best clothes and had the best food. They had lots of the staff that were serving their every need. But now, after the siege is over, these guys are dying in the streets. They're starving on the ash heaps. And the reason for it is sin. Verse 6, For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. So Sodom and Gomorrah and Admon and Zeboim, they disappeared, and not very many people were sorry to see them go because they were just bad places. I mean, there were not even 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom. But here, Jerusalem has been taken down because of their sin. Her princes were whiter, or excuse me, purer than snow, whiter than milk, their bodies more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. So these guys that were the nobility, they were the handsome, strong, uh, beautiful people of society. But that's not the way they look anymore. After the siege was over, verse 8, now their face is blacker than soot because they're just filthy dirty. They've not been able to bathe. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. So because of the lack of food, they've lost all their muscle tone. They're, they look like walking skeletons. And their habitual lack of water and lack of protein has dried up uh, the elasticity of their skin. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. So in this sad song, the people who died in direct military action are considered the lucky ones. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. One of the worst things that we see in siege times is cannibalism. And the worst form of cannibalism is the eating of your own children. And God had already prophesied, even as far back as the book of Deuteronomy, that it would come to that if they sinned against the covenant and ended up coming under the judgment of God. He who is gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger, and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. So the city is burned. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem's been around for a really long time, It existed back in the time of Abraham. And it has been a stronghold throughout all of that period of history. And so people didn't believe that Jerusalem could be taken so easily. And yet, the Babylonians got into it. This was for the sins of her prophets, the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. So this is God's judgment for what the prophets and the priests were doing. They were even engaging in murder. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away! Unclean! People cried at them. Away! Away! Don't touch! so that they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations, they shall not, uh, they shall stay with us no longer. Uh, These prophets and priests are among those, besides cheating the people, they've also lied to them, saying none of this would ever happen. That the city of Jerusalem would never be besieged, that the people would never have to go hungry, that the Babylonians would never succeed in taking the city. So once all that happened, these people became persona non grata. 
amongst the survivors. Nobody wants these false prophets around them anymore. He who is himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. So the leadership, both religious and political, that resisted Jeremiah's calls from the word of God to surrender to Babylon and be safe. The leadership in both the temple and in the palace are now hated by those that have gone into exile. Verse 17, our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. Another thing that the leadership tried to tell them is, somebody will come to our rescue. Egypt, perhaps, will come and save us. Didn't happen, wasn't going to happen. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. So there was no escaping the Babylonians. The breath of our nostrils. He who is as anointed was captured in their pits of whom we say, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. Uh, The Lord's anointed here, not the Messiah in the New Testament sense of Jesus. The Lord's anointed here is a reference to the high priest. And so the hope was that the high priest would be able to go uh, with them into exile and protect them. But we're going to find out in a historical section that's coming up, that the high priest did not survive uh, to go into exile. He was executed as a criminal, as a war criminal. So they don't get it. They do not get uh, the high priest to go with them. Verse 21, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz, Apparently, the land of Uz and Edom are synonymous. Uh, Edom is south and a little bit east of Judah, uh, a little south and east of the southern end of the Dead Sea. Uh, And uh, they have been a thorn in the side of Judah. And they've kind of been agging on the destruction of Judah. And so they become the target of prophecies that they will be next. The Babylonians will get them too. So rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass, and you shall become drink, uh, drunk and strip yourself bare. So you go ahead, make your fun, celebrate the downfall of Judah, but you're next. Verse 22, the punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. So that's a prophecy about the return that we've seen plenty of times. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. So Judah will be restored, but Edom, you're not going to get away with it. You are going to come under judgment. Chapter number five. Remember, O he who is, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. So the promised land is now occupied by others. We have become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. So a lot of death and destruction have uh, disrupted family life. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. So the refugees, because that's effectively what they are, from the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, they have to buy resources at a high price. Resources like water and wood for fire. Our pursuers are on our necks. We're weary. We are given no rest. 
So there's no peace for them uh, in this deportation process. They still have difficulties all along the way. We have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. So they've, they've made deals to try to have enough food. They've made deals with Egypt and Assyria, and they still don't have enough food. Our fathers sinned and are no more. We bear their iniquities. Now, isn't it interesting that they're still trying to play the victim card here? Uh, our forefathers were the ones that sinned, and we're paying the price. And God's response in Ezekiel 18 was, no, that's not the case. You are having this happen to you because of you and your sins. Verse 8, more of the complaints. Slaves rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. Society gets turned tops, uh, gets topsy-turvy uh, in, in these periods of, of relocation. And so sometimes the persons who rise to the top uh, used to be at the bottom of society. So some cases, slaves end up in charge of those that used to be the slaveholders. Uh, we get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. So it's, it's kind of scary trying to find the resources that they need uh, during their, their movement to their new land. Our skin is hot as an oven with the burning heat of famine. So they are malnourished and their bodies are reacting to that. Apparently, a lot of them are running fevers. Uh, description of what happened during the, um, during the military procedures. Women are raped in Zion, young women in the towns of Judah. It is a sad truth that when society breaks down, people with no respect for individual rights will often run roughshod over everybody else. And that includes rapists who take advantage of women uh, during these times of lawlessness. Uh, princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Uh, another thing that happens when society's uh, structure falls apart is that there's reprisals often taken. Uh, people that were low in the culture often take out their anger on those that used to be high in the culture. So aristocracy sometimes are tortured or even killed. That's what's being described here. And no one shows respect for those that should have been respected, like the elders in the society. Young men are compelled to grind at the mill, and boys stagger under the loads of wood. Uh, relocated peoples tend to get the junk jobs, uh, the hard labor things. Old men have left the city gate, the young men their music. Uh, in a normal society, the old men were supposed to be kind of the retired advisors, respected uh, counsel. Uh, in the city gate. But now, in relocation, that's not where they're at anymore. Uh, young men tend to be the ones enjoying life, having lots of music that they can dance and sing to. Uh, well, they've lost that too. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. That's how bad it is. Uh, all the happiness is gone out of their lives. Verse 16, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. We really need that acknowledgement in here. It's important that the people who are suffering under the judgment of God say it's because of our sin that this has happened. Uh, the crown falling from their head has to do with the idea that there is no decoration in their life anymore. It's all been taken away from them. Uh, for this, our heart has become sick. For these things, our eyes have grown dim. Uh, these things have broken their physical bodies as well. Uh, for Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. Because the city has been totally demolished, 
and the people have been removed. When Jeremiah goes back there, what's he going to see? He's going to see it taken over by wild animals. Jackals are running through where the courts of the Solomonic temple used to be. But you, O he who is, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. So even though the palace of Solomon's dynasty is erased, gone, and the temple, the physical temple, gone, all of the residential homes, gone, Jerusalem is nothing but a ruin. It did not change the fact that God is still on his throne. The Ancient of Days has never been deposed. No one has been able to pull him down from his place of leadership. Verse number 20. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so many days? One of the things that comes out in the literature from this time period forward is, why does it feel like God doesn't care anymore? 